All right, so Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17. Now, the master, uh, just a few verses earlier in the previous passage, we saw that he was witnessed in his glory, in his great transfiguration there upon the mountain, and he was witnessed there by Peter, James, and John. And after they witnessed this great transformation of Jesus Christ, after they saw his glory just pour out from his flesh, he also began to instruct them further in his Messiahship, to prove to them. They had some questions. Well, if you really are the Messiah, then what about the prophecies of Elijah coming before the Messiah comes? The scribes say this, and how does this all fit together? And he said, if you can handle it, John the Baptist was Elijah. He came in the spirit and power of Elijah, and he has fulfilled that. And so, don't doubt that I am the Christ. They, they have seen him now in his glory. They are now beginning to pay closer attention to his instruction. They, they don't quite understand everything. And once we get to the resurrection, we will see that they are quite ignorant of all the things that he plainly taught, even here in this chapter. Yet they are beginning to see him in a different way than they ever saw him before. And you recall it all started on that frightening night out there on the Sea of Galilee when he walked out on the water to them. Or excuse me, actually, where he calmed the storm and he says, peace, be still. And it frightened them. It, it amazed them and it terrified them. And they looked at each other and they asked, who can this be? Th this Jesus of Nazareth that we have followed he is not just a normal man. He, he is not simply a man full of the Spirit. There is something more to this man. And now they have seen his great transfiguration as his glory was revealed. They are learning. They're, they're learning slowly. And at times they will appear quite ignorant. But they are beginning to see him in a different way for sure. And so that brings us to verse 14 in Matthew chapter 17. Let's read it through. And when they had come to the multitude, they're coming down from the mountain, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and he came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus answered, so mysterious and so interesting, so full of things to think about. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief or because of your little faith, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So in this brief section. We see the mercy of the master as he deals with this demon-possessed child as the father comes crying on his knees before the Lord. We see his might in casting out the devil. And we also see his mysterious answer to his disciples. This answer that truly does require our, our thought, our contemplation, our thinking it through, thinking it over, and truly challenging ourselves to have faith and trust in our Lord. So first, let's notice his mercy. As they come down from the mountain, this father approaches Jesus. He has been there with the other disciples. Jesus took three disciples with him. The rest have remained. He is there with them, and apparently he brought his son to the disciples of Christ to be healed. And yet the disciples were unable to help this man. They were unable to heal his son. In the Gospel of Mark, we learn that there was quite a crowd around them. Scribes were there. Um, it, it was a 
frenetic atmosphere. There was a lot of discussion going on about this man who had brought his son to these disciples and they were powerless to do anything about it. So Jesus comes into quite the fray. He sees them discussing this. He sees them arguing about this. He sees his disciples powerless to do anything and he sees everybody else wondering why it is that Jesus' followers are not able to cope with the problem presented to them. And so Jesus comes and the man falls on his knees before the Lord. And he says, Have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic, an epileptic as we have here. The reason they chose that translation is because it shows here that he, he suffers, he falls into the fire and off into the water and it, it gives a description of that type of uh, movement, that, that uncontrolled movement and frenzy of the body. And the, the, the Greek word is lunatic. It's someone who is moonstruck, stricken by the moon, uh, just giving way to the superstitions of the day. People didn't know what to make of what was going on with this man's son. But Jesus addresses the truth of the problem. Uh, there's a demon involved. Th this isn't just a, a regular malady. This isn't just a sickness. It's not just a disease. Jesus will mention to his disciples later in his answer how this particular kind is even worse than other kinds. What you are dealing with is not just the regular demon problem that we have encountered and we've seen often through the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus has uh, constantly been dealing with demon activity and he has given his disciples power over demons to cast them out. We have seen his disciples already been sent out and dealing with this themselves, which is why it is shocking to them that they could not handle this problem in the absence of Christ because they have done it before. But apparently they're can be a greater and more intense degree of demon activity that is unlike and stronger than other kinds. That in itself is quite a thought to think about. So Lord, he says, have mercy on my son. He suffers. Lord, help me. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And I love how the Father cries out in that gospel, Lord, I believe, but help this unbelief of mine. It's like, I, I want to believe. I see you in front of me. I, I believe, and yet I have doubts. I have mistrust. I have misgivings. I, I see the problem with my son that we have dealt with, and who knows how long he has dealt with it, but surely it had been going on. And, you know, sometimes when we look at a problem and we, under, we think we understand the problem and how severe it is, it, it makes us feel that, it's too great a problem. So, Lord, I, I believe. I hear what you're saying. Oh, but help my unbelief. And so, Lord, have mercy on my son. I have already brought him to your disciples. They can't help me. Can you help me? Lord, have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon my son. And I, I love this, this word here, mercy. We have seen it before. Son of David, have mercy on me. And whenever somebody cries out for mercy, we see time and again in the scripture that Jesus is merciful. Jesus meets that need. He condescends to whatever the problem is and he shows tenderness. He shows gentleness. And he demonstrates mercy over and over again in the gospel stories. Lord, have mercy on my son. We know that today when we cry out to the Lord, when we get our knee, on our knees as this father did, when we get on our knees for our children, for our marriages, for our uh, financial problems, for our, our work issues, whatever it might be, when we get on our knees and when we pray as this man did, Lord have mercy on me, Lord have mercy on my children, Lord have mercy in this situation, we can be absolutely confident that Jesus is merciful. I love the lesson that Jonah learned over in his book. Perhaps you'll remember. He wanted to see the destruction of Nineveh. He, he finally acquiesced unto the Lord and went and preached that in 40 days Nineveh would be overthrown. He didn't want to preach that message, but he did. And after he preached it, he went up on a hill to watch the city be destroyed. No doubt, having his little calendar, counting down the, de the days. Okay, Lord, 
Now's the time. You're supposed to destroy them. And of course, the Lord relented. And the Lord did not destroy Nineveh. And Jonah's answer is so revealing of the character of God. I knew that you would be merciful. I knew that you would be long-suffering. That's why I didn't want to come here. I was afraid that any message I preached, even though my message was only one of judgment, only one of wrath, I, I didn't tell them, hey, you guys should repent. I just said, 40 days, you're done, you're through, it's over. And yet I knew that if I came here and preached any message, oh, you would send your word and it would not return unto you void. It would accomplish what you wanted it to do. It would accomplish your good pleasure. Lord, I knew you would be merciful to these people. And so I didn't want to come. And Jesus, he is the express image of the Father. He is Yahweh incarnate in human flesh. He is God made man. And so we see Jesus, he has mercy over and over and over again. When people cry out to Jesus, he doesn't say, I don't have time for you. I can't deal with you right now. And even that one woman where she sort of followed him and he would ignore her. She kept pestering him. Lord, even the, the, the dogs get the crumbs from off the master's table. And what did he do? He turned around and says, oh, the faith of this Gentile woman. I have not seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. Woman, your daughter is healed right now. Go home and enjoy this miracle. Jesus is a man of mercy. So I, I think it's important for us to understand that this man, he bears testimony to us today. When we fall on our knees and cry out for mercy, we are crying out before the God of mercy. That, that's why the writer of Hebrews says, come before the throne of grace to receive mercy in times of need. The mercy is there. It's a gracious throne. Just come boldly and receive it. Come boldly and take it. Come boldly and ask for it and pray for it. Pray confidently. And we should be confident. Paul would say we are confident of this very thing that, that all things are working out together for good. See, our God's merciful. And for those who love him, and for those who have been called by him, for those who were chosen according to his purpose, he's, he's working all things out together for good. He, he is one who has shown mercy to his people. Christians may indeed face hardship, suffering, torment, trial. Often Christians face disease and death, even sometimes persecution and martyrdom. And yet, even in those moments, do we not remember the psalmist who says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And the Lord is merciful to us even though so often the world seeks to destroy us even though so often sin might get the best of us the Lord is merciful he is tender-hearted he is gentle and we have so many testimonies of those who have been persecuted and even those who have witnessed the martyrdom of their loved ones we have testimony, do we not, of the faithfulness of God's mercy even in those moments. I think of the brothers, or perhaps they were just friends, but the, the Christian brothers who were persecuted in England under the reign of Bloody Mary. And one of them is fearful of going, I mean, I'm sure they were both fearful of being burned at the stake, but one of them fears that, what if I recant? What if I can't go through with this and I'm just terrified? You need to show me that the Lord is with you when they take you to the stake, when they light you aflame. I need a sign from you. And the, the testimony there uh, written in, in um, Fox's Book of Martyrs of how that first man who went to the flames, after it appeared that the flames had taken his life, he lifted up his hands in praise to the Lord as a sign to the man who would follow him. So even in those moments, the Lord is merciful to his people. We are precious in his sight. And we must understand that just as the Lord had mercy on this man, just as this man could cry out for mercy, so can we in our day. It must be understood. We must have this in our hearts as we go into our prayer closet. How, how can we 
pray unto the Lord unless we believe he is merciful to us, his children. Unless we believe that it is his intention to be there for us and to care for us and to nurture us and to encourage us and to lift us up if we will but humble ourselves before his feet. We must have this understanding. We must know the master's mercy. It will affect us in prayer or if we do not have a firm understanding and, an, and a grasp on his mercy, it will keep us from prayer. Oh, he doesn't care what I'm going through. Does he even know what's happening in my life? If he does know, then why isn't he doing this thing or the other thing or what I wished he would do? Why isn't he coming through the way I want him to? And we can, we can become hardened in our hearts against him and we can resist the thoughts of his mercy and of his love towards us and it can hinder our desire to pray. We basically just throw up our hands and we get angry and we get bitter. But if we understand that he is merciful towards us, that is an attitude of heart that should keep us over and over again coming back to him, knowing for sure and with great confidence that the throne of grace is the place to receive mercy and that the Christ of chapter 17 verse 15 is the same Christ who sits on the throne today who beckons us to come to his side, to bow at his feet, and to bring our requests and petitions to, to make our prayers known to him. So he is merciful, and he meets this man's need, as we know. And then we see his might. Jesus, if he was only merciful, well, that wouldn't be enough, would it? If he was only merciful and could only sympathize with all of our problems and trials, but he could not help us, well, that wouldn't really get us very far. We need to know, and we must believe, that when we go to the throne of grace to receive mercy, that the hand that we reach out for, that the hand that reaches down to us is able to save us to the uttermost is able to deliver us, is able to dispense mercy and grace, is able to help, is able to heal, is in control of all things. It is not enough to believe in his mercy. We must also believe in his mightiness, in his power, in his strength, and in his ability to accomplish his word, to keep his promises to his people. And we see here, nobody else can cure this child. There's a great discussion and commotion about it. Jesus does not hesitate. He decries their faithlessness. Verse 17, oh, faithless and perverse generation. There's so much unbelief, even in my own disciples. Unbelief, inability, staggering at, at the problem before them. How long shall I bear with you? Bring that boy here bring him here to me. And so Jesus immediately rebukes the demon in verse 18. And that demon came out of the boy and the child was cured from that very hour. Now what takes place there that Matthew does not record, when you read it over in the book of Mark, it is a frightening event that takes place. This boy begins to shake and tremble and goes into an epileptic fit. He begins to foam violently, violently at the mouth. And then he appears to be dead. And Jesus picks him up and he is alive. It was a frightening thing that was witnessed there. This was a demon like none the, the disciples had encountered before. And when Jesus rebuked him, he put up a fight. But no matter the fight that the enemy puts up against the master, the master is always going to be victorious. He will make a spectacle out of the enemy. He will triumph over the enemy always and every time. All authority has been given to the master, to the Christ, to Jesus. Everything in heaven, everything on earth has been given. All authority and all power has been granted to him by the Father. Bring him here to me. And Jesus rules victoriously over that demon that had bound and afflicted this child and had brought great harm and terror and sorrow and grief into this family. Jesus has the victory. Jesus overpowers the darkness. Jesus brings this child and delivers him safely back to his father. 
Yes, he's merciful, but he is mighty. He is not someone who can simply sympathize with us. He is the one who can always and in every occasion give us the help we need. So he is merciful and he is mighty and he rebuked the demon. We might as well pause for a moment on verse 17. It is interesting to me. We, Matthew glosses over, as I said, the multitude that was gathered the discussion and the commotion that was going on. But whatever it was that was being said, that was being uttered, that was being argued and debated, it upset the Lord. And he cries out, O oh, faithless generation, O oh, perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Jesus in the book of John, when he was about to do a great miracle, John records he knew what he was about to do. I'm sure we could apply that here. Jesus knew this demon didn't stand a, chan a chance. Jesus understood what the root cause of the problem was, and Jesus dealt with it directly and efficiently. But he looks at all these people, and perhaps he is emphasizing upon his disciples. It's, it's hard to say from this, but I almost wonder faithless and perverse generation because in verse 20 what does he start off by saying to his disciples in private it's because of your unbelief it's because of your little faith this was not a problem that should have been too great for you but you allowed it to be too great for you because you didn't think that the Lord was your help perhaps they were too self-reliant oh well we've done this before come on over here I know how to do this you know, sometimes we get used to ministry, we get used to service, we get used to being used by God in certain ways in a regular fashion, and we just think every problem that comes our way is like the last problem. Well, I did this, I fasted this much, I prayed to the Lord, and we got together at church, had a prayer meeting, put it on the prayer list, and the Lord delivered, answered our prayer, and we had the victory. And we just think it's always going to be the exact same thing, the exact same way, and we can sometimes be unprepared by a different kind of problem. A problem of another type, of a greater intensity, of, of a degree of spiritual warfare that we perhaps hitherto were unfamiliar with. We had never seen that roaring lion reel up on his hind legs like that before. We, we were used to getting the victory in every prayer. And sometimes we come against something that is far beyond what we ever expected. And the problem is, sometimes when our problems increase in intensity, sometimes our faith begins to decrease in equal fashion. Oh, well, last time this worked and it's not working anymore. What am I going to do? And we fret and we worry and we're anxious. Jesus points out the unbelief of his own disciples. So I can't help but think in verse 17 they were being included in this. And so we look at his mysterious answer. Verse 20. This son of God, this man who's just radiated his glory between, uh, among some of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, he looks and he sees, why can't people trust and believe in the power of God? Haven't my disciples at least seen enough? They've seen me calm the storm. They've seen me raise the dead. They've seen me cast out demons. I've sent them out with power. I've given them the keys to the kingdom in chapter 16. Why is it that when they face a greater problem, they begin to back up? Oh no, maybe we're not ready for this. Maybe our God can't handle this. And so we look at his mysterious answer. They come to him privately after he heals the child. Why couldn't we do this? Why couldn't we cast him out? We've done this exact same thing before. Why couldn't we do it this time? And so Jesus says, very candidly, because you didn't believe. Because you had little faith. Unbelief. Little faith. What does James tell us? If you pray not believing, then don't expect you're going to receive anything. You're, you're like a man tossed to and fro on the waves. 
When we pray, it is to pray amiss. If we just throw up a prayer in hopelessness, well, God, if you're there, maybe you can do something. There's no faith there. There's no belief there. There's no trust. There's no personal relationship with the Father, with the Son, with the Spirit, with our God. Because of your unbelief, don't expect to receive the answers to your prayer if you don't believe that God can help you. He will not hear that prayer. We must pray according to his will, and part of his will is trust me. For assuredly, he says, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, the smallest of grains is the mustard seed. Just little tiny, you can hardly see it. If you could just have this much, if you would just, at the very core of your being, trust me. If you would just trust me. Just that's it. If you would just have the faith as a mustard seed, then you will say to this mountain, that they look at this boy, they can't cast out the demon. This is a mountainous problem. This is an overwhelming affliction. This is beyond us. If it's beyond us, that's to tell the world it's beyond our God. We become a bad testimony. Oh, our faith can't handle this. Our scripture doesn't give us the encouragement for this. Our God must not be strong enough for this. That's the testimony we give. And read the Old Testament, how God feels, especially in Ezekiel, about giving, about his people giving a bad testimony to the world. Causing the Lord Almighty to be blasphemed by Gentiles because his own people don't faithfully serve him, don't truly trust him. If you could just have that core faith, if you would just trust me, just start right there, it doesn't have to be big, you just, I just trust the Lord. Then you would say to this overwhelming mountain of a problem, move from here to there. I mean, just imagine, you see old Mount Baldy on these last few days, it's been so clear and beautiful. Just this massive mountain, I believe it's the tallest peak in California. Move. And so imagine that's, the problem. Imagine that's this demon-possessed boy. Imagine that is whatever your family might be facing at a certain instant where it just feels, feels like there is a mountain in front of you that is unscalable. It, it's insurpassable. If you would just have faith, and remember, the Bible knows nothing of, of blind faith. It knows nothing of, of abstract faith. When you see faith in Scripture, it is speaking of Trust in the Lord. Faith in Christ. Dependence on the Father. Reliance on the Spirit. That's what's being said here. Jesus isn't just saying, believe in yourself. That's what the movies say. That's what our songs preach. Believe in yourself. The hope is in you. You're the miracle. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about not trusting in yourself, but trusting in the Lord. If you would just trust me, doesn't have to be fancy. Just trust me. Just throw this to me. Trust me. Then the mountain will move. The problem will be overcome. Because it won't be you trying to overcome it. It will be God intervening and taking care of it. And notice how he ends. And nothing will be impossible for you. Anytime somebody comes into this church with a child who's afflicted, like this father, it will not be impossible for the disciples of Jesus. Anytime somebody comes with an overwhelming prayer request, it will not be impossible for the disciples of Jesus. Jesus is telling them back then, and he's telling us here right now, my disciples can be used to meet the needs, any need that comes, comes against them in the world. And they can meet it and it will not overwhelm them. It will not be impossible to them because their God will provide for them. Because as we said, he's not only merciful, he's mighty. This is the lesson here. There, there won't be any problem. In other words, when you see the mountain, 
you will see the one who made the mountain. When you see the demon affliction, you will see the hand of the one who has power over the devils. Instead of seeing the mountain, you will see the maker of the mountain. You will see the one who's greater than the problem. And you will trust him to deal with it. And that's always the trick for us, isn't it? To trust the Lord for everything in our lives. To rely on him. To, to truly seek from his hand our daily bread. It's not an easy thing that he says to his disciples here. They were challenged by this just as we would have been and so often just as we are. They were men just like us and they struggled to believe these things just as we do. It's such an awesome story and we want to believe it. We want to have this kind of faith and yet when that mountain sits in front of us, when we are frightened to death of what we're dealing with, what we're looking at, what's been thrown in our direction, when we don't have the answers for people who come looking for counsel, we need right away to depend upon the Lord. He's merciful and he's mighty. And he says if we would just trust him, nothing will be impossible for us to deal with. He will give the grace that is necessary. And he notes to his disciples, however, this kind, this particular malady, there's something deeper going on here, something more intense. It requires prayer. Now, I think in general, the Bible would teach us, the New Testament would emphasize that we should be people of prayer. Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Help us to forgive those around us that do harm to us. We are called to be people of prayer, but sometimes we need to go a bit deeper. We need to be sober-minded. Instead of just taking for granted, oh yeah, Lord, help that. Sometimes we need to seek his face in an, in an even greater way. And I think Jesus is trying to help his disciples to see that. Sometimes you really need to go deeper with the Lord and to seek his face in a in a greater way, in a more impassionate way, in a more intense way. Sometimes intercession is real work. It's one thing we can just gather together at a prayer meeting and, and offer up our prayers together. That's, that's fine and that's wonderful. But perhaps you know, I know I have been in those instances where there's something that has been brought to your attention, somebody needs intercession, and it becomes real work. It becomes labor. It becomes a great striving. And there's turmoil of heart and soul and spirit. And you can just feel yourself being drained. And you can feel yourself being tied up in knots. And you can feel your spirit just striving over this problem. Sometimes we need to do that. And we need to be faithful to those around us to be ready and willing, willing to get down on our knees like this man taught us. To get down on our knees with the Lord and strive with him on behalf of those in need. This kind does not go out except by prayer. So we see his mercy, we see that he is mighty, and we see his mysterious words here about nothing being impossible. His mysterious words about higher degrees of demon activity and spiritual warfare. Let's not be ignorant, brothers and sisters, that we are at war. Let's not be ignorant of the devil and his devices. Let's not be ignorant that there are principalities in high places warring against us. We need to be ready to fight. We need to be on the battlefield. We need to take up the whole armor of God. I believe this is the lesson that we need to hear. Let's pray.